and must have had their absolute origin within the known space-time continuum, whereas the first sources of the other beings can only be guessed at with bated breath. All this, of course, assuming that the non-terrestrial linkages and the anomalies ascribed to the invading foes are not pure mythology. Conceivably, the old ones might have invented a cosmic framework to account for their occasional defeats, since historical interests and pride obviously formed their chief psychological element. It is significant that their annals failed to mention many advanced and potent races of beings whose mighty cultures and towering cities figure persistently in certain obscure legends. The changing state of the world through long geologic ages appeared with startling vividness in many of the sculptured maps and scenes. In certain cases, existing science will require revision, while in other cases its bold deductions are magnificently confirmed. As I have said, the hypothesis of Taylor, Wagner, and Jolly that all the continents are fragments of an original Antarctic landmass which cracked from centrifugal force and drifted apart over a technically viscous lower surface, an hypothesis suggested by such things as the complementary outlines of Africa and South America and the way the great mountain chains are rolled and shoved up, receives striking support from this uncanny source. Maps evidently showing the Carboniferous world of an hundred million or more years ago displayed significant rifts and chasms destined later to separate Africa from the once continuous realms of Europe, then the Volusia of hellish primal legend, Asia, the Americas, and the Antarctic continent. Other charts, and most significantly one in connection with the founding fifty million years ago of the vast dead city around us, showed all the present continents well differentiated and in the latest discoverable specimen, dating perhaps from the Pliocene age, the approximate world of today appeared quite clearly despite the linkage of Alaska with Siberia, of North America with Europe through Greenland, and of South America with the Antarctic continent through Graham Land. In the Carboniferous map, the whole globe, ocean floor and rifted land mass alike, bore symbols of the Old One's vast stone cities, but in the later charts the gradual recession toward the Antarctic became very plain. The final Pliocene specimen showed no land cities except on the Antarctic continent and the tip of South America, nor any ocean cities north of the 50th parallel of south latitude. Knowledge and interest in the northern world saved for a study of coastlines probably made during long exploration flights on those fan-like membranous wings had evidently declined to zero among the old ones. Destruction of cities through the upthrust of mountains, the centrifugal rending of continents, the seismic convulsions of land or sea bottom, and other natural causes was a matter of common record, and it was curious to observe how fewer and fewer replacements were made as the ages wore on. The vast dead megalopolis that yawned around us seemed to be the last general center of the race, built early in the Cretaceous Age after a titanic earth buckling had obliterated a still vaster predecessor not far distant. It appeared that this general region was the most sacred spot of all, where reputedly the first old ones had settled on a primal sea bottom. In the new city, many of whose features we could recognize in the sculptures, but which stretched fully an hundred miles along the mountain range in each direction beyond the farthest limits of our aerial survey, they were reputed to be preserved certain sacred stones forming part of the first sea-bottom city which were thrust up to light after long epochs in the course of the general crumpling of strata. 8. Naturally, Danforth and I studied with a special interest and a peculiarly personal sense of awe everything pertaining to the immediate district in which we were. Of this local material there was naturally a vast abundance and on the tangled ground level of the city we were lucky enough to find a house of very late date whose walls, though somewhat damaged by a neighboring rift, contained sculptures of decadent workmanship carrying the story of the region much beyond the period of the Pliocene map whence we derived our last general glimpse of the pre-human world. This was the last place we examined in detail, since what we found there gave us a fresh immediate objective. Certainly we were in one of the strangest, weirdest, and most terrible of all the corners of Earth's globe. Of all existing lands it was infinitely the most ancient, and the conviction grew upon us that this hideous upland must indeed be the fabled nightmare plateau of Lang, which even the mad author of the Necronomicon was reluctant to discuss. 
The great mountain chain was tremendously long, starting as a low range at Luitpold land on the coast of Weddell Sea and virtually crossing the entire continent. The really high part stretched in a mighty arc from about latitude 82 degrees, east longitude 60 degrees, to latitude 70 degrees, east longitude 115 degrees. With its concave side toward our camp and its seaward end in the region of that long, ice-locked coast whose hills were glimpsed by Wilkes and Mawson at the Antarctic Circle. Yet even more monstrous exaggerations of nature seem disturbingly close at hand, I have said that these peaks are higher than the Himalayas, but the sculptures forbid me to say that they are Earth's highest. That grim honor is beyond doubt reserved for something which half the sculptures hesitated to record at all, whilst others approached it with obvious repugnance and trepidation. It seems that there was one part of the ancient land, the first part that ever rose from the waters after the Earth had flung off the moon and the old ones had seeped down from the stars, which had come to be shunned as vaguely and namelessly evil. Cities built there had crumbled before their time and had been found suddenly deserted. Then when the first great earth-buckling had convulsed the region in the Comanchean Age, a frightful line of peaks had shot suddenly up amidst the most appalling din and chaos, and earth had received her loftiest and most terrible mountains. If the scale of the carvings was correct, these abhorred things must have been much over forty thousand feet high radically vaster than even the shocking mountains of madness we had crossed. They extended, it appeared, from about latitude 77 degrees, east longitude 70 degrees, to latitude 70 degrees, east longitude 100 degrees, less than 300 miles away from the dead city, so that we would have spied their dreaded summits in the dim western distance had it not been for that vague opalescent haze. Their northern end must likewise be visible from the long Antarctic Circle coastline at Queen Mary Land. Some of the old ones in the decadent days had made strange prayers to those mountains, but none ever went near them or dared to guess what lay beyond. No human eye had ever seen them, and as I studied the emotions conveyed in the carvings, I prayed that none ever might. There are protecting hills along the coast beyond them, Queen Mary and Kaiser Wilhelm lands, and I thank heaven no one has been able to land and climb those hills. I am not as skeptical about old tales and fears as I used to be, and I do not laugh now at the pre-human sculptor's notion that lightning paused meaningfully now and then at each of the brooding crests, and that an unexplained glow shone from one of those terrible pinnacles all through the long polar night. There may be a very real and very monstrous meaning in the old narcotic whispers about Cadith and the cold waste. But the terrain close at hand was hardly less strange, even if less namelessly accursed. Soon after the founding of the city, the great mountain range became the seat of the principal temples, and many carvings showed what grotesque and fantastic towers had pierced the sky where now we saw only the curiously clinging cubes and ramparts. In the course of ages the caves had appeared, and had been shaped into adjuncts of the temples. With the advance of still later epochs, all the limestone veins of the region were hollowed out by groundwaters, so that the mountains, the foothills, and the plains below them were a veritable network of connected caverns and galleries. Many graphic sculptures told of explorations deep underground, and of the final discovery of the Stygian sunless sea that lurked at Earth's bowels. This vast nighted gulf had undoubtedly been worn by the great river which flowed down from the nameless and horrible westward mountains and which had formerly turned at the base of the Old One's range and flowed beside that chain into the Indian Ocean between Bud and Totten lands on Wilkes's coastline. Little by little it had eaten away the limestone hill base at its turning, till at last its sapping currents reached the caverns of the groundwaters and joined with them in digging a deeper abyss. Finally its whole bulk emptied into the hollow hills and left the old bed toward the ocean dry. Much of the later city, as we now found it, had been built over that former bed. The old ones, understanding what had happened, and exercising their always keen artistic sense, had carved into ornate pylons those headlands of the foothills where the great stream began its descent into eternal darkness. This river, once crossed by scores of noble stone bridges, was plainly the one whose extinct course we had seen in our aeroplane survey. Its position in different carvings of the city helped us to orient ourselves to the scene as it had been at various stages of the region's age-long, eon-dead history, 
so that we were able to sketch a hasty but careful map of the salient features, squares, important buildings, and the like, for guidance and further explorations. We could soon reconstruct in fancy the whole stupendous thing as it was a million or ten million or fifty million years ago, for the sculptures told us exactly what the buildings and mountains and squares and suburbs and landscape setting and luxuriant tertiary vegetation had looked like. It must have had a marvelous and mystic beauty, and as I thought of it I almost forgot the clammy sense of sinister oppression with which the city's inhuman age and massiveness and deadness and remoteness and glacial twilight had choked and weighed on my spirit. Yet according to certain carvings, the denizens of that city had themselves known the clutch of oppressive terror, for there was a somber and recurrent type of scene in which the old ones were shown in the act of recoiling affrightedly from some object, never allowed to appear in the design, found in the great river and indicated as having been washed down through waving, vine-draped cycad forests from those horrible westward mountains. It was only in the one late-built house with the decadent carvings that we obtained any foreshadowing of the final calamity leading to the city's desertion. Undoubtedly there must have been many sculptures of the same age elsewhere, even allowing for the slackened energies and aspirations of a stressful and uncertain period. Indeed, very certain evidence of the existence of others came to us shortly afterward, but this was the first and only set we directly encountered. We meant to look farther later on, but as I have said, immediate conditions dictated another present objective. There would, though, have been a limit, for after all hope of a long future occupancy of the place had perished among the old ones, there could not but have been a complete cessation of mural decoration. The ultimate blow, of course, was the coming of the great cold which once held most of the earth in thrall, and which has never departed from the ill-fated poles the great cold that, at the world's other extremity, put an end to the fabled lands of Lomar and Hyperborea. Just when this tendency began in the Antarctic, it would be hard to say in terms of exact years. Nowadays we set the beginning of the general glacial periods at a distance of about 500,000 years from the present, but at the poles the terrible scourge must have commenced much earlier. All quantitative estimates are partly guesswork but it is quite likely that the decadent sculptures were made considerably less than a million years ago, and that the actual desertion of the city was complete long before the conventional opening of the Pleistocene, 500,000 years ago, as reckoned in terms of the Earth's whole surface. In the decadent sculptures there were signs of thinner vegetation everywhere, and of a decreased country life on the part of the old ones. Heating devices were shown in the houses, and winter travelers were represented as muffled and protective fabrics. Then we saw a series of cartouches, the continuous band arrangement being frequently interrupted in these late carvings, depicting a constantly growing migration to the nearest refuges of greater warmth, some fleeing to cities under the sea off the faraway coast, and some clambering down through networks of limestone caverns in the hollow hills to the neighboring black abyss of subterranean waters. In the end it seems to have been the neighboring abyss which received the greatest colonization. This was partly due, no doubt, to the traditional sacredness of this especial region, but may have been more conclusively determined by the opportunities it gave for continuing the use of the great temples on the honeycombed mountains and for retaining the vast land city as a place of summer residence and base of communication with various mines. The linkage of old and new abodes was made more effective by means of several gradings and improvements along the connecting routes, including the chiseling of numerous direct tunnels from the ancient metropolis to the black abyss, sharply down-pointing tunnels whose mouths we carefully drew, according to our most thoughtful estimates, on the guide map we were compiling. It was obvious that at least two of these tunnels lay within a reasonable exploring distance of where we were, both being on the mountainward edge of the city, one less than a quarter mile toward the ancient river course, and the other perhaps twice that distance in the opposite direction. The abyss, it seems, had shelving shores of dry land at certain places, but the old ones built their new city underwater, no doubt because of its greater certainty of uniform warmth. The depth of the hidden sea appears to have been very great, so that the earth's internal heat could ensure its habitability for an indefinite period. The beings seem to have had no trouble in adapting themselves to part-time and eventually, of course, whole-time residence underwater, since they had never allowed their gill systems to atrophy. 
There were many sculptures which showed how they had always frequently visited their submarine kinsfolk elsewhere, and how they had habitually bathed on the deep bottom of their great river. The darkness of inner earth could likewise have been no deterrent to a race accustomed to long Antarctic nights. Decadent though their style undoubtedly was, these latest carvings had a truly epic quality where they told of the building of the new city in the cavern sea. The old ones had gone about it scientifically, quarrying insoluble rocks from the heart of the honeycombed mountains and employing expert workers from the nearest submarine city to perform the construction according to the best methods. These workers brought with them all that was necessary to establish the new venture, Shagoth tissue from which to breed stone lifters and subsequent beasts of burden for the cavern city, and other protoplasmic matter to mold into phosphorescent organisms for lighting purposes. At last a mighty metropolis rose on the bottom of that Stygian sea, its architecture much like that of the city above, and its workmanship displaying relatively little decadence because of the precise mathematical element inherent in building operations. The newly bred Shagoths grew to enormous size and singular intelligence, and were represented as taking and executing orders with marvelous quickness. They seemed to converse with the old ones by mimicking their voices, a sort of musical piping over a wide range, if poor Lake's dissection had indicated a right, and to work more from spoken commands than from hypnotic suggestions as in earlier times. They were, however, kept in admirable control. The phosphorescent organisms supplied light with vast effectiveness, and doubtless atoned for the loss of the familiar polar auroras of the outer world night. Art and decoration were pursued, though of course with a certain decadence. The old ones seemed to realize this falling off themselves, and in many cases anticipated the policy of Constantine the Great by transplanting especially fine blocks of ancient carving from their land city, just as the emperor in a similar age of decline stripped Greece and Asia of their finest art to give his new Byzantine capital greater splendors than its own people could create. That the transfer of sculptured blocks had not been more extensive was doubtless owing to the fact that the land city was not at first wholly abandoned. By the time total abandonment did occur, and it surely must have occurred before the polar Pleistocene was far advanced, the old ones had perhaps become satisfied with their decadent art, or had ceased to recognize the superior merit of the older carvings. At any rate, the eon-silent ruins around us had certainly undergone no wholesale sculptural denudation, though all the best separate statues, like other movables, had been taken away. The decadent cartouches and dados telling this story were, as I have said, the latest we could find in our limited search. They left us with a picture of the old ones shuttling back and forth betwixt the land city in summer and the sea cavern city in winter, and sometimes trading with the sea-bottom cities off the Antarctic coast. By this time the ultimate doom of the land city must have been recognized, for the sculptures showed many signs of the cold's malign encroachments. Vegetation was declining, and the terrible snows of the winter no longer melted completely even in midsummer. The saurian livestock were nearly all dead, and the mammals were standing it none too well. To keep on with the work of the upper world, it had become necessary to adapt some of the amorphous and curiously cold-resistant Shagoths to land life, a thing the old ones had formerly been reluctant to do. The great river was now lifeless and the upper sea had lost most of its denizens except the seals and whales. All the birds had flown away, save only the great, grotesque penguins. What had happened afterward we could only guess. How long had the new sea cavern city survived? Was it still down there, a stony corpse in eternal blackness? Had the subterranean waters frozen at last? To what fate had the ocean-bottom cities of the outer world been delivered? Had any of the old ones shifted north ahead of the creeping ice cap? Existing geology shows no trace of their presence. Had the frightful Mego been still a menace in the outer land world of the north? Could one be sure of what might or might not linger even to this day in the lightless and unplumbed abysses of Earth's deepest waters? Those things had seemingly been able to withstand any amount of pressure, and men of the sea have fished up curious objects at times, and has the killer whale theory really explained the savage and mysterious scars on Antarctic seals noticed a generation ago by Borkgravink? The specimens found by poor Lake did not enter into these guesses, for their geologic setting proved them to have lived at what must have been a very early date in the land city's history. They were, according to their location, certainly not less than thirty million years old, and we reflected that in their day the sea cavern city, 
and indeed the cavern itself had no existence. They would have remembered an older scene, with lush tertiary vegetation everywhere, a younger land city of flourishing arts around them, and a great river sweeping northward along the base of the mighty mountains toward a faraway tropic ocean. And yet we could not help thinking about these specimens, especially about the eight perfect ones that were missing from Lake's hideously ravaged camp. There was something abnormal about that whole business, the strange things we had tried so hard to lay to somebody's madness, those frightful graves, the amount and nature of the missing material, Gedney, the unearthly toughness of those archaic monstrosities, and the queer vital freaks the sculptures now showed the race to have. Danforth and I had seen a good deal in the last few hours, and were prepared to believe and keep silent about many appalling and incredible secrets of primal nature. 9. I have said that our study of the decadent sculptures brought about a change in our immediate objective. This, of course, had to do with the chiseled avenues to the black inner world, of whose existence we had not known before, but which we were now eager to find and traverse. From the evident scale of the carvings we deduced that a steeply descending walk of about a mile through either of the neighboring tunnels would bring us to the brink of the dizzy, sunless cliffs above the great abyss, down whose side adequate paths, improved by the old ones, led to the rocky shore of the hidden and nighted ocean. To behold this fabulous gulf and stark reality was a lure which seemed impossible of resistance once we knew of the thing, yet we realized we must begin the quest at once if we expected to include it on our present flight. It was now 8 p.m., and we had not enough battery replacements to let our torches burn on forever. We had done so much of our studying and copying below the glacial level that our battery supply had had at least five hours of nearly continuous use, and despite the special dry cell formula, would obviously be good for only about four more, though by keeping one torch unused except for especially interesting or difficult places, we might manage to eke out a safe margin beyond that. It would not do to be without a light in these Cyclopean catacombs, hence in order to make the abyss trip we must give up all further mural deciphering. Of course we intended to revisit the place for days and perhaps weeks of intensive study and photography, curiosity having long ago got the better of horror, but just now we must hasten. Our supply of trailblazing paper was far from unlimited, and we were reluctant to sacrifice spare notebooks or sketching paper to augment it, but we did let one large notebook go. If worst came to worst, we could resort to rock chipping, and of course it would be possible, even in case of really lost direction, to work up to full daylight by one channel or another if granted sufficient time for plentiful trial and error. So at last we set off eagerly in the indicated direction of the nearest tunnel. According to the carvings from which we had made our map, the desired tunnel mouth could not be much more than a quarter mile from where we stood, the intervening space showing solid-looking buildings quite likely to be penetrable still at a subglacial level. The opening itself would be in the basement, on the angle nearest the foothills of a vast, five-pointed structure of evidently public and perhaps ceremonial nature, which we tried to identify from our aerial survey of the ruins. No such structure came to our minds as we recalled our flight, hence we concluded that its upper parts had been greatly damaged, or that it had been totally shattered in an ice rift we had noticed. In the latter case the tunnel would probably turn out to be choked, so that we would have to try the next nearest one, the one less than a mile to the north. The intervening river course prevented our trying any of the more southerly tunnels on this trip, and indeed, if both of the neighboring ones were choked, it was doubtful whether our batteries would warrant an attempt on the next northerly one, about a mile beyond our second choice. As we threaded our dim way through the labyrinth with the aid of map and compass, traversing rooms and corridors in every stage of ruin or preservation, clambering up ramps, crossing upper floors and bridges, and clambering down again, encountering chalked doorways and piles of debris, hastening now and then along finely preserved and uncannily immaculate stretches, taking false leads and retracing our way, in such cases removing the blind paper trail we had left, and once in a while striking the bottom of an open shaft through which daylight poured or trickled down, we were repeatedly tantalized by the sculptured walls along our route. Many must have told tales of immense historical importance, and only the prospect of later visits reconciled us to the need of passing them by. As it was, we slowed down once in a while and turned on our second torch. If we had more films, we would certainly have paused briefly to photograph certain bas-reliefs, 
but time-consuming hand-copying was clearly out of the question. I come now once more to a place where the temptation to hesitate, or to hint rather than state, is very strong. It is necessary, however, to reveal the rest in order to justify my course in discouraging further exploration. We had wormed our way very close to the computed side of the tunnel's mouth, having crossed a second-story bridge to what seemed plainly the tip of a pointed wall, and descended to a ruinous corridor especially rich in decadently elaborate and apparently ritualistic sculptures of late workmanship, when, about 8.30 p.m., Danforth's keen young nostrils gave us the first hint of something unusual. If we had a dog with us, I suppose we would have been warned before. At first we could not precisely say what was wrong with the formerly crystal-pure air, but after a few seconds our memories reacted only too definitely. Let me try to state the thing without flinching. There was an odor, and that odor was vaguely, subtly, and unmistakably akin to what had nauseated us upon opening the insane grave of the horror poor Lake had dissected. Of course the revelation was not as clearly cut at the time as it sounds now. There were several conceivable explanations, and we did a good deal of indecisive whispering. Most important of all, we did not retreat without further investigation, for having come this far we were loath to be balked by anything short of certain disaster. Anyway, what we must have suspected was altogether too wild to believe. Such things did not happen in any normal world. It was probably sheer irrational instinct which made us dim our single torch, tempted no longer by the decadent and sinister sculptures that leered menacingly from the oppressive walls, and which softened our progress to a cautious tiptoeing and crawling over the increasingly littered floor and heaps of debris. Danforth's eyes, as well as nose, proved better than mine, for it was likewise he who first noticed the queer aspect of the debris after we had passed many half-choked arches leading to chambers and corridors on the ground level. It did not look quite as it ought after countless thousands of years of desertion, and when we cautiously turned on more light, we saw that a kind of swath seemed to have been lately tracked through it. The irregular nature of the litter precluded any definite marks, but in the smoother places there were suggestions of the dragging of heavy objects. Once we thought there was a hint of parallel tracks, as if of runners. This was what made us pause again. It was during that pause that we caught, simultaneously this time, the other odor ahead. Paradoxically, it was both a less frightful and a more frightful odor, less frightful intrinsically, but infinitely appalling in this place under the known circumstances, unless, of course, Gedney. For the odor was the plain and familiar one of common petrol, everyday gasoline. Our motivation after that is something I will leave to psychologists. We knew now that some terrible extension of the camp horrors must have crawled into this nighted burial place of the eons, hence could not doubt any longer the existence of nameless conditions present or at least recent just ahead. Yet in the end we did let sheer burning curiosity or anxiety or auto-hypnotism or vague thoughts of responsibility toward Gedney or what not drive us on. Danforth whispered again of the print he thought he had seen at the alley turning in the ruins above, and of the faint musical piping, potentially of tremendous significance in the light of Blake's dissection report, despite its close resemblance to the cave-mouth echoes of the windy peaks, which he thought he had shortly afterward half heard from unknown depths below. I, in my turn, whispered of how the camp was left, of what had disappeared, and of how the madness of a lone survivor might have conceived the inconceivable, a wild trip across the monstrous mountains and a descent into the unknown primal masonry but we could not convince each other, or even ourselves, of anything definite. We had turned off all light as we stood still, and vaguely noticed that a trace of deeply filtered upper day kept the blackness from being absolute. Having automatically begun to move ahead, we guided ourselves by occasional flashes from our torch. The disturbed debris formed an impression we could not shake off, and the smell of gasoline grew stronger. More and more ruin met our eyes and hampered our feet until very soon we saw that the forward way was about to cease. We had been all too correct in our pessimistic guess about that rift glimpsed from the air. Our tunnel quest was a blind one, and we were not even going to be able to reach the basement out of which the abyssward aperture opened. 
The torch, flashing over the grotesquely carven walls of the blocked corridor in which we stood, showed several doorways in various states of obstruction, and from one of them the gasoline odor, quite submerging that other hint of odor, came with a special distinctness. As we looked more steadily, we saw that beyond a doubt there had been a slight and recent clearing away of debris from that particular opening. Whatever the lurking horror might be, we believed the direct avenue toward it was now plainly manifest. I do not think anyone will wonder that we waited an appreciable time before making any further motion. And yet, when we did venture inside that black arch, our first impression was one of anticlimax. For amidst the littered expanse of that sculptured crypt, a perfect cube with sides of about twenty feet, there remained no recent object of instantly discernible size, so that we looked instinctively, though in vain, for a farther doorway. In another moment, however, Danforth's sharp vision had descried a place where the floor debris had been disturbed, and we turned on both torches full strength. Though what we saw in that light was actually simple and trifling, I am none the less reluctant to tell of it because of what it implied. It was a rough leveling of the debris, upon which several small objects lay carelessly scattered, and at one corner of which a considerable amount of gasoline must have been spilled lately enough to leave a strong odor, even at this extreme super-plateau altitude. In other words, it could not be other than a sort of camp, a camp made by questing beings who, like us, had been turned back by the unexpectedly choked way to the abyss. Let me be plain. The scattered objects were, so far as substance was concerned, all from Lake's camp, and consisted of tin cans as queerly opened as those we had seen at that ravaged place, many spent matches, three illustrated books more or less curiously smudged, an empty ink bottle with its pictorial and instructional carton, a broken fountain pen, some oddly snipped fragments of fur and tent cloth, a used electric battery with circular of directions, a folder that came with our type of tent heater, and a sprinkling of crumpled papers. End of Side 7 To continue, turn the cassette over. Side 8 Tales of H.P. Lovecraft by H.P. Lovecraft Continuing with At the Mountains of Madness on page 201 It was all bad enough. But when we smoothed out the papers and looked at what was on them, we felt we had come to the worst. We had found certain inexplicably blotted papers at the camp which might have prepared us, yet the effect of the sight down there in the pre-human vaults of a nightmare city was almost too much to bear. A mad Gedney might have made the groups of dots in imitation of those found on the greenish soapstones, just as the dots on those insane five-pointed grave mounds might have been made, and he might conceivably have prepared rough, hasty sketches, varying in their accuracy or lack of it, which outlined the neighboring parts of the city and traced the way from a circularly represented place outside our previous route, a place we identified as a great cylindrical tower in the carvings, and as a vast circular gulf glimpsed in our aerial survey, to the present five-pointed structure and the tunnel mouth therein. He might, I repeat, have prepared such sketches, for those before us were quite obviously compiled as our own had been from late sculptures somewhere in the glacial labyrinth, though not from the ones which we had seen and used. But what this art-blind bungler could never have done was to execute those sketches in a strange and assured technique, perhaps superior, despite haste and carelessness, to any of the decadent carvings from which they were taken, the characteristic and unmistakable technique of the old ones themselves in the dead city's heyday. There are those who will say Danforth and I were utterly mad not to flee for our lives after that, since our conclusions were now, notwithstanding their wildness, completely fixed, and of a nature I need not even mention to those who have read my account as far as this. Perhaps we were mad, for have I not said those horrible peaks were mountains of madness? But I think I can detect something of the same spirit, albeit in a less extreme form, in the men who stalk deadly beasts through African jungles to photograph them or study their habits. Half paralyzed with terror though we were, there was nevertheless fanned within us a blazing flame of awe and curiosity which triumphed in the end. Of course we did not mean to face that or those which we knew had been there, but we felt that they must be gone by now. They would by this time have found the other neighboring entrance to the abyss and have passed within to whatever night-black fragments of the past might await them in the ultimate gulf 
the ultimate gulf they had never seen. Or if that entrance, too, was blocked, they would have gone on to the north, seeking another. They were, we remembered, partly independent of light. Looking back to that moment, I can scarcely recall just what precise form our new emotions took, just what change of immediate objective it was that so sharpened our sense of expectancy. We certainly did not mean to face what we feared, yet I will not deny that we may have had a lurking unconscious wish to spy certain things from some hidden vantage point. Probably we had not given up our zeal to glimpse the abyss itself, though there was interposed a new goal in the form of that great circular place shown on the crumpled sketches we had found. We had at once recognized it as a monstrous cylindrical tower figuring in the very earliest carvings, but appearing only as a prodigious round aperture from above. Something about the impressiveness of its rendering, even in these hasty diagrams, made us think that its subglacial levels must still form a feature of peculiar importance. Perhaps it embodied architectural marvels as yet unencountered by us. It was certainly of incredible age according to the sculptures in which it figured, being indeed among the first things built in the city. Its carvings, if preserved, could not but be highly significant. Moreover, it might form a good present link with the upper world, a shorter route than the one we were so carefully blazing, and probably that by which those others had descended. At any rate, the thing we did was to study the terrible sketches, which quite perfectly confirmed our own, and start back over the indicated course to the circular place, the course which our nameless predecessors must have traversed twice before us. The other neighboring gate to the abyss would lie beyond that. I need not speak of our journey, during which we continued to leave an economical trail of paper, for it was precisely the same in kind as that by which we had reached the cul-de-sac, except that it tended to adhere more closely to the ground level and even descend to basement corridors. Every now and then we could trace certain disturbing marks in the debris or litter underfoot, and after we had passed outside the radius of the gasoline scent we were again faintly conscious, spasmodically, of that more hideous and more persistent scent. After the way had branched from our former course, we sometimes gave the rays of our single torch a furtive sweep along the walls, noting in almost every case the well-nigh omnipresent sculptures, which indeed seemed to have formed a main aesthetic outlet for the old ones. About 9.30 p.m., while traversing a vaulted corridor whose increasingly glaciated floor seemed somewhat below the ground level, and whose roof grew lower as we advanced, we began to see strong daylight ahead, and were able to turn off our torch. It appeared that we were coming to the vast circular place, and that our distance from the upper air could not be very great. The corridor ended in an arch surprisingly low for these megalithic ruins, but we could see much through it even before we emerged. Beyond there stretched a prodigious round space, fully two hundred feet in diameter, strewn with debris and containing many choked archways corresponding to the one we were about to cross. The walls were, in available spaces, boldly sculptured into a spiral band of heroic proportions, and displayed, despite the destructive weathering caused by the openness of the spot, an artistic splendor far beyond anything we had encountered before. The littered floor was quite heavily glaciated, and we fancied that the true bottom lay at a considerably lower depth. But the salient object of the place was the titanic stone ramp, which, eluding the archways by a sharp turn outward into the open floor, wound spirally up the stupendous cylindrical wall like an inside counterpart of those once climbing outside the monstrous towers or ziggurats of antique Babylon. Only the rapidity of our flight and the perspective which confounded the descent with the tower's inner wall had prevented our noticing this feature from the air, and thus caused us to seek another avenue to the subglacial level. Pabodi might have been able to tell what sort of engineering held it in place, but Danforth and I could merely admire and marvel. We could see mighty stone corbels and pillars here and there, but what we saw seemed inadequate to the function performed. The thing was excellently preserved up to the present top of the tower, a highly remarkable circumstance in view of its exposure, and its shelter had done much to protect the bizarre and disturbing cosmic sculptures on the walls. As we stepped out into the awesome half-daylight of this monstrous cylinder bottom, Fifty million years old, and without doubt the most primally ancient structure ever to meet our eyes, we saw that the ramp traversed sides stretched dizzily up to a height of fully sixty feet. This, we recalled from our aerial survey, meant an outside glaciation of some forty feet, 
since the yawning gulf we had seen from the plain had been at the top of an approximately twenty-foot mound of crumbled masonry, somewhat sheltered for three-fourths of its circumference by the massive curving walls of a line of higher ruins. According to the sculptures, the original tower had stood in the center of an immense circular plaza, and had been perhaps five hundred or six hundred feet high, with tiers of horizontal discs near the top and a row of needle-like spires along the upper rim. Most of the masonry had obviously toppled outward rather than inward, a fortunate happening since otherwise the ramp might have been shattered and the whole interior choked. As it was, the ramp showed sad battering, whilst the choking was such that all the archways at the bottom seemed to have been recently half-cleared.